We can represent phase changes by using what we call a warming curve. What you can see is that um, when you start below zero for water, um, it is a solid. And what we do is we warm up, and that's where we're changing. What we're going to call kinetic energy, EK, is changing as we warm the particles till we get to the point where we have to stop for a little while. Because at the point at zero for water, the ice starts to melt. And so what's occurring at B is the melting point. So as we go across, the particles start to separate. And so here we're changing potential energy. And so we are breaking up the particles. And so on the diagonals, we're going to see that we're heating them up. Or if we're going backwards, we'll be cooling them down. But then what's happening as we're going across at these plateaus is that we're breaking them up. This will continue as we um, go on from now a liquid state. And so at this point, again, we are changing kinetic energy. And we're heating up the particles until we hit 100 degrees. And so again, we're going to have a change of potential energy because the particles are going to spread away from each other. Potential is the energy of position. So the particles, you can see, are further apart here than they are here. So we're changing our potential energy when we change phase. But when we're just heating up the particles, as we're going up the diagonals, then we're just changing kinetic energy. So a potential energy changes here. We're going to be boiling. Or if we're going to go backwards, then we're going to be condensing. Again, changing in potential energy. Now, as we get to be a gas, then we can heat up again. And so again, we're going to be changing our kinetic energy. Now, we can actually put formulas on this information. and so. Looking at some numbers then, we're going to calculate how much energy it takes to warm it up and how much energy it takes to heat it up. So we have very specific formulas that we use for this. So on the line segments that actually change, the formulas that we'll use in there are going to be Q. Remember, Q equals heat. Then the specific heat, in this case of a solid, times the mass that you're heating up times the change in temperature. So it'll be specific to that line segment. That's also going to happen when you're at the line segments here from liquid to liquid. In this state, we're just warming up a liquid. Same formula, just our specific heat is a little different because it takes a different amount of heat to warm up a liquid than it does in the solid state. So again, same formula. And then the same exact thing is going to happen when we get from a gas to a gas. We're still a gas here. We're just warming the gas up, changing in kinetic energy. So Q is equal to the specific heat of the gas, M delta T. Well, where do I find these specific heats? They're going to be given to you in a chart. So here's the specific heats for each one of the states of matter. And so then what happens along the plateaus is that we're just changing potential energy. We're not changing temperature. We're just changing position of the particles. And so there we need a different formula. Well, if you notice, up at the top, there's another chart. We have heat of vaporization and heat of fusion. And those are joules per gram. It's very, very, very simple because it tells me how much heat it takes to melt one gram or to freeze one gram if we lose the energy. So what if we have more than one gram? So again, we still have Q, but it's going to equal to the mass times the heat of fusion when we're down here on the lower line. When we're cold, think of freezing fusion, also alphabetically F, comes before V. And so then in the middle up here, we're going to have Q is equal to mass times heat of vaporization. So heat of vaporization is HV, heat of fusion is HF. And so we just multiply because that's for one. But we have, if we have more than one, we just multiply by the mass. So let's take a look at a problem. What I want to know is how much energy would it take to uh, take some ice? Let's say I want to make some ice. So I've got some water. Let's say the water's sitting um, at about 50 degrees Celsius. And I want to cool that water. So I want to take some water from uh, 50 degrees Celsius to ice at negative 10 degrees Celsius. And let's say I have 30 grams of water. So I want to go through and work this problem. 
So what I do is I figure out where am I on this graph. And so I'm just going to kind of mark that this is negative 10. And then let's say up here is 50 degrees. So I want to travel from 50 degrees and then make it all the way. So I'm going to travel over. I'm going to have to freeze it. That's what's going on at that point, at point B. And then I'm going to then cool it down some more to 10 degrees. So notice I have three line segments to deal with. And since I have three line segments to deal with, I have three formulas to deal with. So I'm just going to start with the first one and start plugging in some numbers. So the first thing I'm looking at is I'm starting here. So obviously I'm using this formula. So the specific heat for the liquid is right there, 4.18. I know my mass in the problem, mass is always your grams, 30 grams. And then I need to figure out what's my temperature change on this blue line segment. Well, I'm starting at 50, going to zero. So 50 minus zero is 50 degrees Celsius. And then I just multiply that all together, 4.18 times 30 times 50. And I end up with 6,270 joules. We're going to see it takes quite a bit of energy to go through these changes. So then the next step is I'm going to look at this little freezing line segment. So what's happening here is it tells me that, oh, it's MHF. Well, I know M, M is still the same amount. M is still 30 grams. And I know from up here in the chart, HF is 334. It tells me it takes 334 joules to melt one gram, but I have 30 grams to melt. So if I then multiply 30 times 334, I get 10,020 joules. Again, quite a bit of energy to, and in this case, it's actually going to be lost, not gained, because I want to freeze the ice or freeze the water into ice. So then the last step is very similar to the blue step that we did over here. And so I'm going to plug in the um, information down here for the solid now, because at this point I've taken my water and I've cooled it down to zero. Now I've frozen it. Now it's solid ice, but it's still at zero degrees, so I want to cool it now a little bit more to negative 10. So I look up here and I see that the solid number, solid, is 2.1. So I'm going to plug that in. 2.1. That's joules per gram for one gram and one degree Celsius, but I don't have one gram. I actually have 30 grams still. And then what is my change in temperature on this line? Well, my change in temperature is from 0 now to minus 10, so my change in temperature is 10. And just always make your change in temperatures positive. It's just the difference. How much did it change? I don't care what direction we're going in. So if I multiply all these together, I get 630 joules. So this process, again, just kind of go, going back over it, I had to cool it from... 50 down to 0, and that took 6270 joules. Then I had to freeze it, so I had to lose 10,020 joules. Plus, and then I had to then cool it some more, and that took 630 joules. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to add up all these numbers. So it's like taking like little legs of your trip, how how um, much did it end up costing me? So if I add all this up, it's 16,920 joules. Or if you want to convert that, you can move the decimal over three places and make it 16.9 kilojoules. So that's how we work problems. Now sometimes I may just ask you a question where you're just going to have to do one step. So you may just have to do the convert the liquid um, and cool it down. So you might have only had to do the 6270. But if there are multiple phases, multiple changes that are taking place on your graph, you have to add them all up.